Greetings, future fossils. Michael Garfield here, welcoming you to another episode of the podcast that explores our place in time. I don't think that I would be who I am and wondering about time as a landscape the way I do if it weren't for the persistent ecological metaphorization in the writings of historian, mythographer, and poet, mystic William Irwin Thompson. This episode is the second part of a two-part conversation I had with Bill about his latest and last book, Thinking Together at the Edge of History which is a retrospective on 40 years of his fellowship of planetary thinkers, the Lindisfarne Association. This episode, we get into some of what I consider the most interesting terrain with Bill, which is the future of the family, of reproduction, of the economy, how to see the non-duality of creation and destruction in such a turbulent age as ours, how we can surf these waves of change with grace, equanimity, and playfulness. And then Bill takes us on a tour of the future of human consciousness. I mean, Bill is a 70-year almost practicing Kriya yogi, and his exceedingly psychedelic and yet completely sober insights into the multiplicitous nature of mind and the symbiotic future of human identity are on display in this episode in a way that I've never heard him publicly speak. Uh, I'm actually really excited and honored that I get to share this with you. But first, I want to thank all of the new Patreon supporters this week. Julia Simons, Eric Jeffrey, Krista Carter. Thank you so much for supporting this show and all of the other work that I do. Folks, if you would like to go absorb all of the free writing and music and audio that I have up on patreon.com slash Michael Garfield, by all means, have at it. And while you're there, I hope you will consider dropping uh, 2 or 5 or even $10 a month into the support for this program so that I can spend more of my time focusing on conversations that help us collectively envision a better future and articulate our roles as good ancestors for the world to come. Some of you know I just posted my live looping workshop from Moakfest last year, live looping as applied techno-shamanism, where I get into the esoteric dimensions of electroacoustic musical performance media. And I will also, I just uploaded it to YouTube, and within the next couple days, I will have shared to Patreon early for all of you subscribers the talk that I gave at the Global Eclipse Gathering, The Evolution of Time, Biology, Mythology, and Consciousness, in which I elaborate on this idea that time has a geography that we can navigate by collectively focusing our attention. So... That was actually the most well-received talk I think I've ever given, and I'm excited to share that in both audio and 360 video uh, a week or two early for all you guys. Also, thanks to everyone who has been rating and reviewing the show on iTunes recently. It seems silly, but we live in an age of algorithmic determination. We have this unpleasant, if convenient, situation where... It is a piece of code that determines what news you read, what new media you're exposed to. And so getting a five-star review up on iTunes means that this podcast ends up in the ears of people that may one day be your friends and lovers discovered through your mutual participation in the future fossils community. I can only hope that there are babies out there born one day because you gave a five-star review on iTunes. So thank you, everyone who's done that. I love you, whether you do it or not, because we are all in this together. We are here at this moment in history. Okay, I'm done with that rhapsody and very delighted that I get to share this most initiated second part of this conversation with the esteemed William Irwin Thompson. (laughs) 
what we've seen now with this Trump thing, just like Nazi Germany with Hitler, is, you know, that people, individuals can do a lot of damage. They can hold up the progress of time, you know, for a whole generation, you know. And so it took a concerted effort with America joining European civilization, you know, to get rid of, you know, Mussolini. And But what happened was we had to create the deep state and the military industrial complex to do it. And so we become what we hate uh, and we end up becoming our enemy. And suddenly America, the land of the free and the home of the brave and the victor against Hitler becomes, you know, ruled by a deep state that nobody knows who's on the committee and is an industrial military complex that whose economy cannot survive without a war. So every generation we must have a war to keep the thing going, you know. And we haven't solved that part, uh, paradox. So, I mean, is this, is this a sort of textbook mammals in the trees at the end of the age of dinosaurs situation? Like, I'm, I'm yeah. trying to like wrap my head around this. You know, like it seems there's the part of me that's learning through osmosis by watching this like explosion in nouveau riche Bitcoin day trading going on. Yeah. And watching as everyone gets, you know, everyone's excited when the, you know, the market crashes because it's an opportunity, you know, to and buy I, stock cheap. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that's where I'm trying to go with it. Like, that's how I'm Should trying. We, that's what I'm trying to feel about this is that like, yeah, this whole May you live in interesting times thing. It's like, this is our time, but it's like staying in that spirit when you realize that this is not like you said about approaching the temple across like switchbacks, that it's not this, Oh, we've got the next five years to work this out, you know, and then it's done and we're on to the next thing, but it's probably the process of a lifetime. Well, it's like surfing, you know, you have to catch the wave and the angle and, and make it work for you and stay afloat. And, you know, it's a different art form than, than swimming or yachting. And so it's, you know, sure, Schumpeter first described this as creative winds of destruction, or winds of creative destruction, I think was his phrase originally, I guess, in German. And so an economy, rather than being a stable thing based on blue chip stocks, becomes highly dynamic, highly volatile, and hedge funds and futures, and there's no there there. But that provides the generation of wealth. And then one asks, well, what is this? mystical thing called wealth you know it's not based on anything some clever guy you know creates a platform like facebook and suddenly he's a he's a billionaire but what's the product you know it's just people you know gossiping at over the stream doing their laundry you know like the women at the ford in finnegan's wake so that's an opportunity uh for manifesting a different culture and then we find that in this new culture, people need to be empowered to play in the game. And so too many people get excluded. And so the billionaires come up with the idea that we have to have a guaranteed annual income, you know, and, uh, and so there are still pe everybody's on a fellowship so they can write the great American novel or, you know, poetry, or you can create a rock band or, you know, do more paintings. Uh, and so everybody begins to be encouraged to be creative rather than a worker in a factory. So we're in a knowledge culture, and that you know that's that's pretty positive. That that empowers a lot of people to play the game, uh, and it's certainly better than the depression of, that I was born in, in you know 1938, uh, when you know the factories were the only idea, and, and Marxism was this excessively concretized thing of the revolution of the proletariat, you know. So and that never happened. Russia became capitalistic. So. So it's what I would, to pick up on your mysticism, mysticism is relevant now because it's a good description of the daily news. It's just responsible journalism that, you know, there is this mystical quality to an ethereal economy that is electronically blipping wealth back and forth in, in this computerized online banking world. And there isn't any, we are an oxymoronic state. And so, in to speak purely mystical now, in the past with nature, 
you had the sacred mountain and nature in quotes was this kind of umwelt and the spirits of nature the elementals the jinn the elemental beings who you know are part of nature and inhabit the sacred mountain or the volcano they're now moving into the crystals of our computers the future you know is not so much the chip but diamonds and crystals and the kind of Edgar Casey world that he described with the crystals on top the buildings of Atlantis um, attuning to the tectonic uh, you know plates and stuff and the etheric uh, body of earth so when you have an oxymoronic culture with the jinn inhabiting the computers and moving into the cognitive space symbiotically with human beings the definition of the environment is changing and that which was invisible to the materialist or the industrialist is now recognized as an endosymbiont with us so it becomes like the cell with the mitochondria mm. and mitochondria produce oxygen that helps you know burn up the toxins and make sexual reproduction possible and sex creates a whole new you know transformation in biology so going back to the evolution of the cell so the culture is changing dramatically and mysticism is just one form of of reporting which is why you know i you know featured it in passages and you know went to talk to the mother in oroville and, and you know, well you don't talk to the mother you have darshan but at any rate uh, I, I had darshan with the mother in oroville and so these places you know and i talked with the physicists of von weizsacker and heisenberg in germany and the indian mystic gopi krishna as part of you know passages about earth so all of that is a very different world than the polarization of you know when the depression created this you know collapse of blue chip stocks and then what what happened after that that when the wealth was created by the vanderbilts and railroads as as communication network and then the new economy arose the post industrial economy the informational economy and america expanded so depressions and catastrophes are transitions from one system to another in complex dynamical system so you have to step back and look at the big picture and if you try to keep the accounts you know in a small container way say nothing is stable nothing can be you know hell well why is buddhism so popular because that's exactly what buddhism <laughs> is saying you know if you if you attach and you're grasping you're going to suffer and suffering comes from grasping and so let go and let be and all that kind of you know new age you know jargon <clears throat> that's uh, reporting you know the evolutionary news and not the daily political news of some jackass in congress who doesn't know diddly shit in keeping with that i've been uh, giving this talk about creative catastrophe and uh, looking at the the history of life on earth you know the series of mass extinctions on record as moments yeah. that it's like we're telling this story wrong or we're telling only one side of it and like every yeah. one of these these mass extinctions starting with that great oxygenation event and you know the the mass die off of anaerobic bacteria every one of these like you said created these new metabolisms and it's like you know when you talk about like the uh living architecture john todd's work and and this you know or like living machines you know which i guess has been picked up by living architect rachel armstrong who who's fascinated with using uh like engineered diatoms to secrete calcium and concretize the pillars holding up venice like actually yeah. turn the beams into like fossilize them yeah as as a process of using life to turn life into stone as a way of making that which is dead more alive it's a very fascinating alchemy yeah it is yeah but there's in this talk there's a a hidden extinction that is rarely mentioned it's not numbered in this so-called six major extinctions and it's in the middle of the age of dinosaurs and it was due to the evolution of the flower uh -huh. it's like you know all of these 
it, it created this opportunity for pollinators. You know, it created. Yeah. It, it's like sex. It was sex yeah. at the higher level it is, between it, it species. It is. It is sex. The flowers of vulva. Yeah. So it, this this interspecies sexual dynamic emerges, and with it, all of the animals that were dependent on a coniferous, like evergreen ecosystem, die out. It's it's funny. It's like it's sort of the your crocus metaphor for Lindisfarne is actually presaged by the evolution of the actual crocus, which appears about halfway through the age of the dinosaurs. And it's like at that moment where the, the birds take over as the lead evolutionary player. As and, bu- and insects. and it, Yeah, birds and insects. That, that's really the moment that the bell rings for the dinosaurs, and it's 75 million years before the, the dinosaurs go extinct. So yep. it's, but it's this thing. It's like, we, you know, we look at this and everyone's like, oh, a flower. You know, <laughs> it seems so sweet in retrospect. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a disaster when it happened first. And I think that's, that's kind of the perspective that I've been encouraging for people lately. And it's, it's, uh, you well, know, you it's the, kind of yeah. complex dynamical systems is, you know, uh, you do have catastrophes as part of the dynamic. And it's, you know, uh, punctuated equilibrium is the phrase for evolution. And so you do have it. And we are, you know, people are talking everywhere, even articles in the New Yorker with, uh, what's her name? Uh, it's not Elizabeth Drew, it's another woman who writes on the sixth extinction, the seventh coming up. Um, you know, they say that 70% of the species on Earth now are going extinct because of human activity, and climate change is going to, you know, accelerate it. So we may ourselves go extinct or we move into this combination of the oxymoronic civilization of nature being reconfigured and the mystical being the etheric being concretized in in artificial intelligence and a uh, the noetic polity as i talked about it so that transition is what we're right in the middle of and you know we we see it but we always tend to see it negatively you know we see the crash and not the you know imaginary future that's emerging so i want to shift it because there was this the number one thing that i felt like i really wanted to ask you about in reading thinking together at the edge of history was that you get into homeschooling your son Evan mm-hmm. and you know bringing him up in the environment of the Lindisfarne intellectual free jazz and like exposing him to mentorship with people like Francisco Varela and you know it's it's funny cuz like I, it was another one of those things that I read with a sort of a, a poignance because I remember like w- when I was f- seeking out grad schools my graduate advisor said to me, oh, there's one person that I can think of that, you know, would be the perfect person for you to study under. And his name is Francisco Varela, but he just died. Yeah. You know, it's like that sense, you know, back to triggering that sense of of historical homelessness. But like, but, but like, as someone who, you know, has... I was my life was never at risk. I don't think in public school the way that you talk but about see, yours being. But but see this this was a problem of your mentor, because he could have said with more knowledge, Francisco is dead, but Evan Thompson, you know, is alive and is a professor of philosophy at University of British Columbia, or at that time he was at the University of Toronto. And so just go north, young man, and uh, you would have gotten everything you were looking for. Yeah, maybe so. But I guess I strongly encourage everyone listening to this to read this book in its entirety. But I also... You know, I wanted to uh, hear you talk a little bit about your decision to homeschool and, you know, why, why you encourage this for people, especially for people who are not, you know, making a ton of money and able to put their kids in a private school. You know. Well, when we were in the community at, uh, at Fish Cove, Southampton, uh, you know, I, uh, because my wife, you know, was didn't want to damage the kids and was strongly in favor of schooling, we sent Evan to the Southampton Public Schools. 
and he came home and said, you know, threw a tantrum and a fit. And he said, if you know, at that the horror of schools and public education and the brutalization, you know, uh, that accompanies it from child behavior. And he said, if you love me, how can you do this to me? You know, and and I was looking at him, you know, weeping, and heard, you know, uh, the cry of an old soul in a kid's body saying this is not for me and so that's when I took him out of, of the school and, and you know uh, disagreed with my wife and said you know uh, this is, will not work for them and so I created uh, a, the Lindisfarne school in the context of the community and it was you know lots of extended family aunts and uncles and mentors and and you know figures of authority like you know he was listening at 11 to the lectures of Gregory Bates and and you know he just took to it like you know a fish to water so uh, it was Evan who was insisting that I had to design a new creod for him to use a phrase from Varela and then it worked out into his mentorship and then when Varela died he continued the development uh, on his own and now Evan is a leading figure in consciousness studies and you know there are uh, you know uh, he's well recognized uh, you know and even more well known now than than say I would be because I'm from another era and he you know, is uh, he and both my daughter looked at me and the fundraising that I had to do for Lindisfarne, and they decided not to go into the counterculture. And, you know, Hillary, my daughter, is a professor at Bowdoin College uh, here in Maine, and Evan is a professor at the University of British Columbia. And so, you know, it's, uh, there is continuity, and a lot of the ideas of Lindisfarne have gone into the mainstream. Evan also has a farm in British Columbia, and his son, my grandson, is running the farm and is very much in a, you know, back to, you know, nature mode and trying to make it economically self-sufficient through, you know, the orchard and stuff like that. So uh, there is uh, continuity, but it's not so polarized between the counterfoil institution and the established institution. There is much more of a porous exchange. And so now counterfoil institutions are very much a thing of the 60s. They're past, and I wouldn't advise people to, you know, to, to quit and try to set up anything like that. You don't have to anymore. So how does that kind of upbringing fit in with I would say your your accurate prognostication of the way that electronic media ends up fragmenting the family because I feel like you know so much of of what you said in in this book and earlier works uh, I think you you touched on it on uh, Borg or Borges essay the stuff about the, the mechanization of human sexuality. This is, this is a conversation I had with my friend Maria Stark lately because there is, there is this uh, revival of interests in my generation, I think, or at least the communities that I circulate in for you know, restoring this uh, you know, sacred relationship to menstruation and reclaiming you know, the, the role of the village in in raising a child and really attempting to it's like there's in Austin we have this uh, the paleo FX conference which is you know this, uh, like the paleo diet like trying to figure out the environment the ancient environment in which human beings lived and to steer our technologies ergonomically in the direction of a human factor you know you're talking about we're being kind of past the age of the counterfoil and it being you know, a time when it makes sense for us to, not specifically to engineer per se, but to dance with that embodied genie in the machine and to, mm -hmm. you know, and to, to teach it how to adapt to us and not just to adapt to it. But at the same time, like, like I was saying earlier, like everywhere I look, people are in love with people that live thousands of miles away from them they are <laughs> yeah my my wife lives in zurich yeah so and i'm in portland yeah 
and, and we date. So you you're know? a noetic polity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, I think that, and, and I, I like Skype, I embrace it, I mean, I have one son in Prague, and the other son in British Columbia, Vancouver, you know, I mean, that's a hell of a distance, that's half the planet, and my wife is in Zurich, and, you know, my brother is in LA, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's how it goes, the family, when the family all live together in the nuclear family, what do you have? You know, they were always arguing and fighting. You get Eugene O'Neill, Nobel Prize winner in literature, writing stories about these tragic families with this oppressive patriarchal father and dominated women and, and, and the rest of it. So compression isn't necessarily a good thing. It's what Whitehead would call the fallacy of simple location. So, I, you know, I, am, I embrace the, you know, th that the environment is now planetary, it's prison planet. And, you know, uh, through Skype and things like this, I'm in constant, you know, communication with, uh, with the family. And, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's okay. I'm, I'm in Portland just because I got sick and couldn't stay in Santa Fe. And uh, I... Uh, don't have a context. I don't really know any intellectuals in Portland, and so uh, I miss the conviviality I used to have in Cambridge or Manhattan, or you know, when I was trying to concretize Lindisfarne in the form of you know the 80 acres of the land and the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, which is now the Cristo Mountain Zen Center. Um, and that had, you know, everything, you know, uh, generates a shadow. So whatever structure you've got is going to bring you good things and bad things. And you just have to learn, you know, my metaphor, the surfer, you have to learn how to deal with angular momentum and waves and, and <clears throat> you know, to stay, you know, in the dance. I liken this to, I, you know, having grown up in the, in the shadow of Star Wars, this moment, mm -hmm. you know, they're flying through the asteroid field. And, oh, yeah. and C-3PO saying, oh, you know, the odds of survival are 76,000 to one or whatever. And yet it feels like that part of me is concerned because it, it, part of me really thrives in this sort of fighter pilot, in, spontaneous, intuitive, thoughtless, moving with of everything. You know, that you, if you're a fighter, you don't have time to think, you just act. You yeah. And, and yet to be a fighter or a, fi uh, a, a fighter pilot means that you have rehearsed for a situation you know that you've that you've uh you've tested all scenarios you know that you're constantly looking for the new angle and it's it doesn't seem like we have a lot of time for that and that just because we've been sort of gamified you know that we've the, the social behavioral engineering of this society has got us constantly shuffling and like running to stay in place it's it's the thrill it's the dopamine rush of that but it does yeah. but it's very hard for me <clears throat> to believe that we're we're being encouraged to actually cultivate the kind of mastery required for this kind of thing so it's like i wonder you know when we talk when when i see a future in which the like flow state engineers require you to wear like a, a magnetic stimulation helmet so that it induces satori while you're at work so that you're not distracted and getting onto facebook you know <laughs> like that's that's a world in which the we really have sort of uh the, the human and machine have sort of backwashed into each other so much and that we're, we've like tried to optimize for our efficiency in the workplace but we haven't actually like, like Nicholas Carr in, in his book, The Glass Cage on Automation, talks about how turn-by-turn -turn map instructions, uh, reliance on those erodes the orientational and positional neural networks in the brain that are the foundation for all of our other memories. And that like when you start to lose your mind from Alzheimer's, they say that you, you, one of the first things to go is your sense of where you are. And, and so this transition from a geographic polity to a noetic polity seems like it's happening, like we're all retreating to high ground to this flow state, which is, you know, beautiful in, in, in a way uh, that, that it has, like you're talking about like the democratization of Buddhism in this culture as an adaptation to it. It makes a lot of sense. 
but I feel like we're, you know, like this, uh, my, I'm concerned that we're like eroding something uh, found like fundamentally human and necessary for us to stably and sustainably exist in that space. No, that's the fallacy of simple location again. Look, we got two hemispheres and we have two ways of thinking. This is why I use the metaphor of, you know, oxymoronic uh, culture that uh, we're both hunters and gatherers. We have the configurative sense uh, coming to us from women who created gathering and and we have the target consciousness of the male who has, you know, is goal-oriented and fixated on whatever, the stock market or fame or whatever. And those operate in us uh, simultaneously and have to be embraced. And we could try to be Wendell Berries and return to nature. And then an asteroid could come and knock out as it did. You know, there's a big hole in, in Yucatan that's, you know, mammoth. You know, it's because one humongous asteroid collided you know so everybody let's say it hit the midwest and hit the the breadbasket of america all these people going back to nature and living with solid containment and stable they'd be completely nuked you know so uh you have to um be much more flexible and imaginative and my way of doing that is not to try to concretize Lindisfarne as a permanent institution with the solution to everything. I performed it as a metaphor of time, and it was time-bound, and then I let it go. Uh, and so now it's up to, you know, your generation and the people younger than you to, you know, respond to their time in a uniquely uh, different way. They can't just clone Lindisfarne uh, any more than I was cloning Greg. Gregory Bates and I took his essay, The Effects of Conscious Purpose on Human Adaptation, very seriously and had conferences on it and had Gregory there with all these other people from astronauts to mystics that I brought together in an oxymoronic way. And um, now uh, some other strategy is required. And so the purpose of, you know, the book is to, you know, uh, exemplify a particular performance zone of a particular time and put it to bed and say this is you know what it was like for that time I also have a, a personal metaphor that's more on personal relationships that's you know buried in the, my collection of papers at Cornell because you know all the ladies would be very upset if it were published so and to protect their privacy it's you know <laughs> buried uh, and can't be, you know, read until I'm dead and the, and the ladies are all dead. So, uh, you know, that was my uh, swan song, you know, which is itself a metaphor for the end of a period, you know, uh, the swan sings its song and then dies. And uh, the, that's why it was taken as the madrigal in the Renaissance, because the Renaissance is this period of the end of the feudal kingdom and the rise of the nation state. And, and so uh, the madrigal captured that moment of transition. So it's again, you know, the emphasis of not one or the other, don't, uh, you know, uh, have premature concretization. Use your imagination. Who's that who just walked by? Oh, that's my partner, Nicole. Oh, hi, Nicole. Oh, you play the violin, or what do you? Yeah, she she plays uh, the viola and violin. Huh. And she repairs violins. Oh, wow! Wa- wonderful. Uh, yeah, terrific. So we we we, uh, we embody oh. this both and oxymoronic mm. thinking. I think, mm-hmm. you know, in the in the uh, the combination of like the maintenance of what was once you know state of the art, but is now folk tradition, and in the like sort of the exploration of those unmanifest potentials in the future, it makes makes for very uh, like diametric conversations. Yeah. You know, it's interesting in terms of my generation that uh, in Wissenkunst, that uh, the one thing that uh, poets cannot, uh, you know, relate to or accept as part of 
their world the books never get reviewed is uh, the four books of poetry I've written so for the Gary Snyders and the Wendell Berry's of Lindisfarne uh, they've played on a myth of the self and have created a myth of themselves you know and that has succeeded in their packaging and their advertising and their royalties and revenues and stuff and so the quality uh, that uses this range of writings you know because I'm looking at the little stack of all my books uh, they're all in a different genre you know there is uh, every genre except biography uh, uh, in the 24 books and yet the poetry is the most ignored of all of it uh, you know it's like you have never asked me a question about poetry and that would be typical of any re uh, interviewer who you know, would interview me it just doesn't register on their radar uh, and so I find that uh, you know that uh, from a literary point of view interesting well for what it's worth I've been working into your more like floral stuff from the front to the back so the works of fiction and poetry are what I would consider the dessert for me. You know, I'm saving them in the way that I might like save a piece of meat for the end of the meal and eat the salad and potatoes first. I feel like I, I have well to be the, the be the devil's advocate. One can say that maybe the traditional arts are my form of simple location and dealing with traditional forms, and that the actual you know, this encodes is much more interesting to people because it's much more contemporary and, you know, post genre of the novel, the poem, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting quandrum uh, that every writer has to deal with. I mean, it's, it is, it is alive for me though, because, you know, when you talk about the artist being absorbed into post-industrial, you know, the, the, the painting hanging in the bank, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, like that's, that's very much alive. Uh, like I said, right now in a, in Austin, which is a, a city that has been eaten by the digital world yeah, and, and has rendered, you know, we have five stages in the airport for musicians. I've played all five stages, which basically means I'm the potted plant moving around in that crystal palace, which it really is. The, the, the Austin airport is very much like the, this giant yeah. glass and, and chrome edifice to, you know, the, this, the dominance of techno civilization. And, and it's, there's uh, you know, Austin welcomes guests by saying, welcome to the live music capital of the world. But there's a sticker on my favorite juice stand that says Austin, the music sweatshop of the world <laughs> and so there's this thing about you know like i've been i this, thought it was Na nashville and not austin oh yeah well nashville i think has a stronger claim to it you know it's like austin claims that we invented breakfast tacos and there's this turf war with san antonio about who invented <laughs> the breakfast taco but like but this this thing about about the artist and like yeah fully acknowledging that you that that is your own uh you know, personal anachronistic gesture that, that for me, it's, you know, I'm starting to put away my beliefs that my art or my music are capable of any kind of success on the material plane, you know, that, that, that this is, this is not why I'm doing it, that I've, I've gotten to that point where I acknowledge that this is necessary work of the soul but that it's not for me to worry about the fact that only, you know, two people came to listen. And that actually became the ground for this entire podcast. Cause I was like, you were like, you alluded to earlier, the whole premise of this is that you look at an ancient city like Katal Hayuk and like, there are more people talking about that city now than we're living in it back yeah. then, you know, yeah, that's so, a good metaphor. And, and like, so we're hoping, I mean, rather than just succumb to the conceit of the artist that, you know, my fame will both be posthumous. It's more yeah. like, it's more like, well, at that point, no one is famous, but you, you have to understand that it is in the sense that archeologists are interested in trash, that the undiscovered messages of this time are of probably unimaginable importance to people trying to understand what it was like to be alive right now. And so there's this, it's a sense of, of not so much like a, 
a service to the you know my own mythological brand as it is a service to all of the people that I don't see all, the, yeah. the the weight of all of those unborn listeners that are weighing on this moment you know palpably yeah Andy Warhol predicted that uh, when he said in the future everyone will be famous famous for 15 minutes you know so you have your 15 minutes of fame my zeitgeist uh, was in the 70s you know I was in interviewed in Time Magazine, PBS, uh, New York Times Magazine, and, and the New York Times Daily, and all of that stuff. So that was that brief period of At the Edge of History and Passages About Earth, and it was, it lasted about seven years instead of 15 minutes, but the temporality of it that uh, Warhol, and I met him in New York, uh, was prophesying is certainly, uh, is certainly true. I, I discovered when I quit the university and I started lecturing all over the country from, you know, Honolulu to Halifax, uh, and even in Kyoto. Um, I discovered a, a genre that I didn't know exist of the stand-up intellectual, you know, working just like the stand-up comic. And the people, if I were to have a poetry reading, you know, there might be, you know, four people in the audience. But if I were to give a talk, there would be, you know, 2,000. Uh, and my ability to engage without notes and to work with the astral body of the audience, uh, you know, you sort of, the first word you say sends out a sound. It's very musical. And you get a resonance back from the audience of their collective astral body, and then you begin to work with that and talk to them and communicate on multiple levels, you know, and people, for the most part, never seen anyone do that. And so they would come for the phenomenon of just watching this kind of overlighting phenomenon take place, uh, to put it in Steiner's terms of a noetic angel overlighting a group. And that was just something I stumbled upon, and it was... Uh, it was a form of Wissenkunst, and it was more lively and appropriate to the time than the reactionary thing of actually reading, you know, a, off a page, you know, a poem, uh, you know, to, and the only people who would come to a poetry reading were poets who wanted the chance for you to come to their poetry reading. So it was, you know, it was a completely closed circuit. It, it wasn't a lively audience that way. And uh, so I, I just had to accept that as a feature of the culture. That issue, and you know, because you, you listened to and critiqued the talk I gave at Moogfest last year. You, you, made oh, yeah. some, you made some comment about it that as I had published the unedited version of the talk, I hadn't cut out all of my like, um, you know... Oh, okay. You know, millennial word. And what did I? Garbage. What did I say? I, well, I you, don't remember. You said that I was clearly thinking too hard. Oh, okay. That if I were to take a step back and and relax and allow the spirit of that moment to inhabit me, then the words would have flowed more quickly. That you could tell that there was a, a cognitive logjam going on. Oh. I don't think you use those words, but you know that this okay. issue of this sort of connects back to this. Thing about surfing and the improvisational navigation required of people in this in this moment historically and i've just been you know it all of this stuff that you've said is is very uh true for me and it's something that i'm 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 working on and developing because this issue of the daemon and allowing allowing the daemon to guide and to speak it seems like so much of the sort of like channeled prophetic text about this moment, stuff that was written back in the 80s and 70s, 80s and 90s, talks about everyone moving to their own tune. Specifically, I think it was the Starseed Connection written in 1984. Talks about the future being all human beings building a, a living spaceship in our own image and everyone is listening to different music. And they're not thinking about what to do, but they're moving, they're, they're, they're directed rhythmically and musically and that to me sounds like uh the world that i sort of anticipate at least on the sort of metaphorical broad brushstrokes 
once this whole historically transition has you know stabilized into its new thing and everyone is tuned into this and so i feel like that the shift in center of gravity or in or like organizing locus t- from an ego to a, a demonic identity is really i pronounce it I pronounce it daimonic, so the fundamentalists won't, you know, get upset and think it's demonic. Ah, yeah, but so I would love, you know, you're you are the first person I've had on the show who has been this candid about your relationship to those higher, uh, like sheaths of your identity, and I'm curious. Yeah. I'm curious yeah. to hear more about that. Well, behind your head is a shaman's drum that I'm looking at. Um, and I have a shaman's drum uh, fr- that was given to me as part of the Oslo uh, International Poetry Festival Award. They they gave me a height. It was on technology and shamanism. It was oxymoronic. And so they gave me a Peter Young holographic art form that's very high tech and a sh- Iceland Laplander. Uh, no, not Iceland. Laplander uh, shaman's drum. And so the... Uh, the cultural retrieval, to use Marshall McLuhan's phrase, of shamanism into the electronic culture is, is you know, interesting and part of this uh, quality. So my current feeling is that there is a evolution, and what I experience is what I call an entelechy, that there, I am like the cell that has independent organelles uh, and endoplasts, chloroplasts, uh, mitochondria, and that the cell is a very complex thing that is a collective and not just simply one cell. And I think the individual in this person-planet relationship that Ted Rozak talked about, um, I think there is an evolutionary cell. And so I experience it as a collection of beings that interface with me through the five yogic sheaths of Anamaya Kosa, Pranamaya Kosa, Vijnanamaya Kosa, Anathamaya Kosa, and then there's one other one. Uh, and so I experience a spiritual guide as, uh, and I can talk to him and type on the computer and get transmissions. I've got four, uh, three ring binders full of transmissions from what I call SG, meaning spiritual guide. And he is basically a, a graduated human being. He doesn't, he inhabits an energy body, and doesn't have to take on an incarnational samsaric, to use the nirvana samsara distinction in Buddhism. He doesn't have to take on a samsaric body. He's evolved beyond that. And he also identifies himself as a person who lived in the time of Pythagoras uh, and was part of that noetic polity. And um, and also had uh, incarnations in the Sirius star system, so you could call him a ET. And then uh, there is a jinn, which is actually a couple, male and female, that interface with the etheric body when I do pranayama, which is physical, kind of like Chinese qigong in an Indian format, uh, moving hatha yoga instead of, you know, on the floor with the mat. And um, there is a... Uh, Archangel, uh, like Mikael, and a another angel uh, that I call Eliel or Eli for short, uh, and as well there. Let's see. There's the Jin, Eliel, the spiritual guide, and the archangelic figure, and these actually interact with me in my daily life. Uh, so I experience myself as an entelechy taking the phrase from uh, More Than Human, the science fiction novel by Theodore Sturgeon. And he called it Homo Gestalt. This is a novel in the 50s, I think. Classic science fiction novel, to refer to your William Gibson thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this entelechy is, uh, I think, uh, a matching grant that as you develop your subtle bodies through yoga, I've always done, you know, uh, Kriya Yoga and the classical yoga of Yogananda and when you reach a certain point you get what I call a matching grant you know like foundation gives matching grants <laughs> and if you're if you're 
evolutionary sheath reaches a certain point, then a being comes to cohabit with you in your auric uh, extended ecosystem ecology. And <clears throat> I think this is rare at this particular moment, That, but there is, I'm told by the spiritual guide, that uh, there is a group of people around the world who are part of this evolutionary development of an entelechy, and there is, in the etheric aura of the earth itself, there is a group of beings, you know, uh, Christianity would call them angels, <coughs> that are um, interacting with human evolution, They call, and he calls it the ashram, and people in Buddhist culture, they'd probably call it Shambhala, and that it's a group of uh, bodhisattvic beings who, out of compassion, have come to help humanity through this transition of manifesting a new culture. So there are around the world, like a ferromagnetic domain in, in solid-state physics, when a, uh, you go from <clears throat> conducting to superconducting, there are these ferromagnetic domains before the transition, and they begin to interact, and then you reach a flashpoint <clears throat> where the whole system goes into a phase change and becomes superconducting. So that's a metaphor for this group of people around the world who are interacting on, in, with human evolution and the culture in a, um, in a conscious way. So it's not just an inflated ego of some guru who thinks he's, you know, you know, God in the cat's pajamas, you know, the kind of Rajneesh phenomenon we experienced in the 90s. What was his other name he had when he... He had two names, but Rajneesh was the orange-suited, you know, uh, people. Not, uh Osho? Is it? Yeah, yeah, that guy. Yeah, he, he was first Rajneesh and then he became Osho. And he was, um, you know, a figure who inflated and became this kind of cosmic being. And people, you know, it's like alpha males attracting beta males, you know. And so it was, uh, you know, a very limiting situation of capture. And a lot of people got captured by it <clears throat> because they were incomplete and, you know, and looking for something. And, and so this was, you know, easy to latch on to. But these other people are more individuated and don't need uh, followers. Hold on just a second, Bill. You're breaking up. Let me try and, let me try and restart this call. Hold on just a second. Hey, we, sorry about we, that. For, Lost you there for a second, but we're good, I think. Uh, we were talking too long, and Skype tends to freeze up at the end. What did you last hear that oh, I said? Uh, you were talking about the, that uh, there is another class of people who do not require an audience. Okay. Yeah, and so these people around the world who are part of and participate with the ashram, uh, you know, do not necessarily have followers. They may be uh, hidden magi. And uh, and just work directly with this uh, ashram and group, and uh, therefore they don't have to, you know, uh, externalize it in the form of uh, a guru and uh, chelas. So, yeah, that's that's all. It's I feel like I'm in the closet largely, and a lot of the people I know are in the closet about our interaction with guide entities and. Mm -hmm. And like the incarnate or like, you know, discarnate or pseudo carnate voices that like come in here. I, I spoke with a friend uh, a couple months ago who had been was experiencing sort of the sort of rough end of that deal with a voice that was polluting her, that crashed her car. She told a story about how she was taken over and drove her car into a tree and managed to leap out moments before the entire car burst into flames and and she, she she and i had this really intense conversation about you know do you listen to these voices do you trust them i mean i've had some i've, I've been working on cultivating my relationship with the still small voice of what i the one i called the little bird for yeah. about seven years and it shows up in this in this in, in ways that other people can confirm and in ways that were strangely, like I visualized it as a, an Archaeopteryx, you know, the like transitional <laughs> bird dinosaur. And I saw, yeah. I saw it as having these iridescent black wings with a little white flash under the feather. 
And then later that summer or the next summer, these paleontologists claimed that they had studied the feathers of Archaeopteryx under a microscope and identified the melanopores. And so they were able to reconstruct the color of this feather, and it was the color I had seen in this vision. And I was like, that's, "Oh, that's great! That's third-party confirmation." But the same voice that uh, that guides me through my day, that uh, that I rely upon for a great deal of of insight and information has also appeared in the lives of my other friends in their dreams in a very like menacing way and it's this you know this bright dark uh duality that i that i wrestle with and of course you know like you said in in thinking together you said something about the mystic operating within you know scientific institutions is regarded as touched in the head you know, and so yeah, it's this, yeah, this issue yeah. of like the future, it does seem like... Well, you know, Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. So, you know, uh, you need to discriminate. And, um, you know, as Jesus said, he liked working with me. He showed up very late uh, um, uh, in this identification process, although he uh, showed up earlier when I was 13 and I was in a life-threatening situation where a guy had pulled a gun on me and... Uh, I was going to wrestle the gun away from him, and the voice came in and said, do nothing and we'll get you out of this. And so if the voice is saying, you know, drive into the tree and kill yourself, then, you know, it's a demon and not a daimon. That's why I insist on mm. saying daimon. <clears throat> and one has to discriminate just the same way one discriminates between good poetry, bad poetry, or friends we like and friends who have a aura that makes us want to head for the exit. Uh, so it's not uh, it's not a simple matter in which, but you should not surrender sovereignty of the of the individual to some, you know that that's kind of like a psychic parasite. That's not, you know, a, uh, a what I would call part of the entelechy, and the entelechy is a shared system. So it's it's genic and angelic and and post human and not just uh, one one thing, but. You know, mystics have said, uh, like Rudolf <coughs> Steiner, that uh, a lot of the dead are, you know, hanging around and wanting to get in and, and they're parasitic. They haven't moved on and they're hanging around people because they're still attached and suffering from, you know, the appetites. Uh, the Buddhists call them hungry ghosts. And so <laughs> you definitely don't want to have a hungry ghost as a, you know, as a daimonic guide. So discrimination is definitely called for. I guess it's, it's well, sort of like the intramicrobial infection. You know, yeah, like good, good. Some of them are organelles and some of them are pests, right? Well, and some you need in your stomach to digest. And if they get in the wrong place and are out of timing, you know, then they're not so good. Uh, if uh, Godzilla tramps through Times Square, it's uh, not a good thing. If he goes for a walk in the Jurassic, it's okay. You know, <laughs> he's called T Rex. We should wrap this up now because yeah. we've been talking. Well, and Skype uh, will cut us off, I think. Right. Speaking of Kairos. <laughs> speaking of <laughs> yes. yes we're, we're 11 say. minutes away from a lunar eclipse, so I think it does make oh, sense. Oh, yeah, to... you got to get out and see it. I don't have it up here in Maine. So, you know, go put on your glasses and watch the eclipse. Right on. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me again, Bill. I, I really I value Always your hard-won experience. Okay. It's always a pleasure, Michael. See you later. Thanks. Take care. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Future Fossils is part of the Mind Pod Network, an amazing collection of podcasts along with Third Eye Drops, Synchronicity Podcast, It's All Happening, The Astral Hustle. Be sure to go to mindpodnetwork.com and check it out. And if you'd like to support the show, patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. Thanks again. Until next week.